Hey builders, let me tell you about this AWS command line interface course we now have on the INE platform. My name is Brooks Lehorn. I'll be your instructor for this class. Here's my contact information. Have any questions, concerns, problems, things you don't understand about what we're talking about? Feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help you. What will we be talking about? How do you install the AWS CLI? And that includes configuration, security, and verification. What about, how is it set up on an Amazon Linux 2 EC2 instance? Is it available in the cloud shell? And how is it configured? there. Also, help, filter and query, output, and so much more. And we've got a hands-on lab. Spin up an EC2 instance, create an EBS volume and attach it to that running EC2 instance. And then finally, using the AWS CLI, query to see if the EC2 instance has passed its reachability test. There's so much built in to this very short course. And the main point being this, I want to give you the foundational knowledge. So as you go forward with your experience with AWS, you want to start using the CLI over using just the web page or the console. You have a way to quickly figure out what the information you need, how you can get help, and how you can control the output to really get the information you need. I'm super excited about this course. I hope you are too. I'll see you over on the platform to learn all about the AWS CLI. Hey builders, short video here on the AWS CLI. Most of the facts you're probably in this video, you probably already know. I just want to make sure you've got good coverage, particularly when it comes to Docker and also how you can install from source when it, that is necessary. So we're going to look at local installation, Linux, Mac operating system, and Windows. We're also going to look at the availability of it built into Linux AMI version 2, Amazon Linux version AMI. And then, of course, AWS Cloud Shell. And then a quick look at Docker. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't really matter which local install we're doing, the install and the update process are exactly the same. There's no update path. So if you need to update an AWS CLI running local, it's going to be like you're installing it for the first time. The basic gist, whether it's Linux, Mac, or Windows, is you download, which you can see here on the Linux, is simply a curl command. Now, in this case, you're downloading a zip, so you do need to unzip it on the Linux and then finally do the install. With Mac operating system, it's the same idea. We use a curl to bring down the package and then we install it. And that's the thing to remember, we're using a package installer for Amazon to do this. Now, if you have your own package manager built into, say, something like your Mac operating system, use that. For example, brew, the command is so simple, simply brew, install AWS CLI. Finally, on Windows, from the command line, if you don't want to use the GUI to do it and start clicking around, it's simply taking advantage of the MSIEXEC application, point it towards the package you should see there on the screen, the MSI, and it'll pull it right down. Now, that's for what we call the frozen package manager. It'll install for Linux, most Linux, uh, Mac operating systems, Windows, However, there are some cases where it will not work. In those cases, you've got to download and install from source, and it's very easy to do. There's a lot of documentation out there, but for specific cases, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about situations where you have an unusual architecture, like ARM 32-bit. Maybe you're running Alpine Linux. Now, in this case, Alpine Linux doesn't have glibc. Glibc is used by the package manager, so it's going to be a little bit of a challenge there. You'd want to use source. Security hardened systems where shared memory is not allowed. The frozen package manager from AWS needs to have shared memory. It's not going to work. And then finally, and this is probably one of the most interesting, I don't think this would ever come up on an exam, but it's something to know about. In highly secured environments, you typically have something called SEP, the secure engineering process. With SEP, traditionally, unless the package has been vetted some out of band way, what is required is, is that the entire source code is reviewed before it's allowed into that secured environment. For example, the invitation only regions of AWS. Doesn't matter. Any one of these situations happens, you can pull the source. And if it's on Linux or Mac, it's actually just three commands from the command line. Configure, make, make install, and it's running on the system. Now, if you don't want to go through the local install, you just want to take advantage of it, it's built right into Amazon Linux version 2, as well as the AWS Cloud Shell service. Let's jump over to the console and take a look at both of them right now. Now, in the case of the Amazon Linux, which is what I'm already uh, uh, logged into here, we can verify it simply by doing AWS 
dash dash version. Now, as I run this, pay attention to what our output is. We have Bodo Core already installed. We have the other tooling installed. We have Python already installed. And the version of the AWS CLI we're running is 1.18. Let's take a look at Cloud Shell. With Cloud Shell, we tend to have the latest version immediately available. So if I do a dash dash AWS dash dash version here, you'll see that we end up with version 2. There we go, version 2.11. So that's why it's important, and we're going to talk about this more in a moment. Always use the version command to verify what version of the AWS CLI you've got there. In this case, you can see with the Amazon Linux, I haven't run the update command, so we have the older one version. In the case of the Cloud Shell, we have version 2. Now, an interesting thing is this. With Docker, with the right command, you always get the latest version. Let's take a look at that. So here is the Docker command that you can run if you have Docker loaded on your local computer to take advantage of the latest AWS CLI that's out there. Without having to do anything other than just run that command, it'll pull down the latest version. Now, this is the right way to think about this. And by the way, don't start stop the video here and try to run this command. It won't work as is. I'll show you more about the problem with the security of this in the next video. But for now, just focus on this. The stuff that you see on the screen is tantamount to running just the AWS part of the AWS command. You know, typically, like we just saw, we run AWS dash dash version. That right there that you see on the screen. When you're running it in Docker, it looks like this. You simply run all the Docker commands and then finally the service and then any sub commands that you want after the fact. That is the AWS dash dash version. I'm going to jump over to my console. and Let's take a look at how this looks when we run Docker on a local computer. So you can see I'm all set up and ready to go here. Docker run RM and I'm going to be pulling the public uh, AWS CLI. Run that. Whoops. No, I don't want to do that. And then enter. And you can see we, we get version 2.11. Very good. Now, again, in this particular case, don't run this command yet. In the next video, when we talk about security, I'll show you how to pick up security. In this particular case, this is running in a container that's not configured for security. But the thing I want you to remember, though, is this. The AWS dash dash version. Always use that as a way to check the local version of the AWS CLI that you're running. So in conclusion, again, this is a short video just to get you started with the AWS CLI. There's always the local install that you can do, and I showed you for Linux, Mac, and Windows the commands that you need. Remember, though, with the Mac operating system, if need be, you can use your local package manager like Brew to get AWS CLI installed. Don't want to install it? Then you have it available on the Amazon Linux version 2 as well as in Cloud Shell. Simply bring those services up, and you're going to be up and running. Next, if need be, you can always build from source. The idea being there, you got an unusual architecture, uh, you're using something like Alpine uh, Linux that doesn't have glibc, whatever the case may be, you can always pull it from source, check AWS's documentation. They tend to, tend to give you exactly what you need on the configure command to get it set up for that particular target. Finally, there's Docker. You saw the command. In the next video, I'll show you how to run it so you can take advantage of security. It's a great way without needing to worry about, am I running the, running the latest version to simply take advantage of the latest particular container image? And then finally, regardless of the environments you're in, always take a moment and run the AWS dash dash version command to make sure you are running the latest version of the AWS CLI. Hey builders, in this video, I want to go over how to configure and set up security for your AWS CLI instance and look at a couple of different situations where it's not even applicable. So we're going to start off with precedence. Probably one of the most important things you can remember is going to be the precedence order. It's the kind of thing that shows up in exams. Then we'll look at each of the precedents actually set up. We'll look at command options. And just after that, we'll also look at environmental variables. Quick Config, which is actually AWS Config, and I'll run a demo on that showing you how to set up your environment using the key file or the access key and secret access key from AWS Config from the console. We'll look at EC2 instances as well as AWS Cloud Shell and how to use the STS caller identity to figure out who exactly we are.
Finally, Docker, how to mount the local .aws directory, and then a quick word on custom authentication, because that has come up when I've been out in the field with customers. Okay, so here's the basic idea. Think of a situation where you're at a console, you're at a computer somewhere, and you run a basic AWS CLI command. Now, don't worry if you're not familiar with the commands. As we go through this course, we'll do a lot more, but this is the describe instances command. And we've used the region US East one command line option. Now, at the same time though, in this environment, we've set up the AWS default region environmental variable. And this is an important environmental variable because when you run AWS and then whatever, it checks to see if this environmental variable exists. In this case, we've set it to US East 2. But you've also run AWS config and you're in your config file, you've got US West 1. Which region is going to be used? What security footprint are you actually going to be using here? Which access keys are going to be involved? It depends on precedence. In fact, this is probably one of the most important parts of this particular video is just this precedence order. The first three in particular, that is command line options take precedence over environmental variables that take precedence over whatever you've set up using AWS config. Please remember that because it shows up on exams. It also shows up in tricky situations where someone's like, I keep running, you know, AWS, and then you're running some sort of EC2 command, but I'm getting the wrong region. Check to see if there's an environmental variable, for example, that's actually overriding what they expect from their uh, AWS config directory. So on the command line options, you actually have several things you could put in. You could do like a region override, profile override, so you don't get the defaults. So just know right off the bat from the command line options point of view, it takes precedence over everything. So if you set region here, it doesn't matter what you have for environmental variables or AWS config, it's going to win the fight. Now, environmental variables, a lot of folks don't like working with these because it just feels like it's an old school way of doing things, but they're still useful sometimes, like for setting your access key, secret access key. You can also set up a default region, a CLI auto prompt, and things like FIPS if you're working in a federal environment where you got to use FIPS 120. These are all completely acceptable AWS environmental variables. You can find the entire list on the AWS website. Anyway, and they have to be spelled out exactly as you see here, or AWS as it runs as, a, uh, a, as the AWS CLI will actually ignore them. So if these are here, it sees it, it will take precedence over whatever you've used for AWS config. Now, AWS config, or it's called AWS quick configure. This is the way most people actually configure their environment. So what it basically does is it lets you set up your .aws directory. It does it automatically for you, creates a config and a credentials file where it puts your information. So what I want to do is actually I want to go and run this in my local computer so you can see how it's done. But in order to start with, we've got to go out to the console and actually generate an access key and secret access key. When we first run it, it's sort of in setup mode. It's going to ask us for that stuff. Once you've run AWS config, it'll output what's already there and you can overwrite what's appearing. Also, we have import, get, and set, which are very important little quick ways of setting different things like configuration or access keys in your environment without completely running AWS configure from the top. So I'm going to jump into my console, into my terminal, and let's run AWS configure together. Now, when we run AWS Configure for the first time, if there is, if it's never been run or there doesn't exist an AWS directory, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see, you're going to run Configure, hit Enter, and you'll see Access Key ID None. And this is where, for example, you could copy and paste in your values from your Access Key file. I'm going to go out to my console right now and let's generate one of those. So I'm logged in the console as an admin who has this uh, permission to create access keys. I'll scroll down under my user, IAM user, and choose create access key. And this is quite simple. Now, the new, then this has just been recently updated. I'm recording this in March of 2023. They've changed this around a little bit so that when you choose the CLI, you now have to acknowledge, yes, I understand the above recommendation for using, you know, a different approach to doing this. Choose next. Give it a name. I'll name this my admin one key. There we go. Create access key. And there we go. And at this point, this is the access key and secret access key values. If you go back to the terminal or 
whatever you're using and you do AWS configure, this is where we would actually paste in those values. You could actually go back to the console, copy, come back here, paste in your terminal window, and when you're all done, it would be set up. Now, what I want to do instead is I want to show you the import command. So from right here where I generated the key, I'm going to scroll down and choose download CSV file. There we go. And then I'm going to go into this file and make a quick modification. And I'm on a Mac OS. So this all went to the downloads directory. So let's go take a look at this file, bchorn access keys.csv. So this is the file that I downloaded. And please don't try to copy this and use it to access my account. I've already changed a lot of this material, so it actually won't work. So you can see this is actually the copy of the file that I was actually going to be using. What you can do, though, with this to make this much easier so you don't have to do like a copy paste, simply go into the file, create a new header that is go to the first line here and say user name comma. Then here on the actual values file, simply put in a name. So I'm going to name this admin one and then a comma. Now what I can do is I can use the import command of AWS configure to import this without actually having to copy and paste. Now I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to change the actual file that I'm going to be using and then we'll do an import. Okay, so I've updated my actual credentials file. And we're now going to run AWS configure. Then we can say import CSV, so dash dash CSV, and you can see my Terminal's trying to help me out here by auto-completing, and yep, that's exactly where I want it to go. So on this, I'll hit Enter. We get a successful import. Now, at this point, here's the thing about this. This is kind of the trick to it. If you run AWS Configure, what should you see? Well, you should see the access key and secret access key, right? Let's take a look. Configure, Enter, and there's nothing. Why? Well, that's because we created a profile, admin1. And admin1 is where we will actually find that. So if we do, again, AWS configure, and then we say uh, profile admin1 and hit enter, you can see, in fact, it did import. The one thing that's missing, though, is the region. So we got to set that up. Now, we could continue on through and do that as well. But here's another faster way to do it. Simply do AWS configure region US East one profile admin one. You're going to get the kickback because that profile does not exist in the configure command. So this is how we can fix that problem. When you're running that command, you've got to make sure to do your get and set. So AWS configure at this point, then you're going to want to do a set region US East one profile admin one, hit enter, and now it's gone through. So now if you do your AWS configure, you'll see that you have access key, oops, make sure you put that profile in there, profile, admin one, hit enter, and you have your access key, secret access key region, and then the output format, which typically I leave to none. I like to be able to set that on the command line as an option, the dash dash output, whether I want a table, JSON, YAML, things like that. But that's the basic way in which you actually go about setting up AWS configure. You can, you generate, or if you can't, the admin generates the access key and secret access key in the console, import it to your local machine, then you can use import, but remember to use import, you've got to add the username and then a username field, which will be a profile name in the file. Otherwise, you can simply do a copy and paste from that file directly into the AWS configure that you see on the screen. Now, once you've got the AWS, uh, .AWS directory set up, now you can take advantage of the Docker command and use the security from AWS to actually run it. Basically, this is what happens. You want to add in an extra part to the Docker run command, and it's that dash V that you see on the screen right there. What that does is, is that mounts your .aws directory, which is why you see the tilde forward slash .aws for a Mac operating system, colon slash root slash .aws, it mounts it right into the Docker container. So that when you run a command like Docker run RMT, uh, RMIT, public, all that, AWS CLI, and then command is where you replace and use something like S3 LS to list all your containers. This command will now work with the credentials that it finds in the .aws directory. Okay, great. But now here's a question. 
There's other ways also to run the AWS CLI, in particular on an EC2 instance or in Cloud Shell. Now, what are you contextually in terms of security when you run that? Well, that's where the STS get caller identity command comes in. It lets you see who you're actually logged in as. I'm going to jump over into the console. I'm going to spin up Cloud Shell. I'm going to log into an EC2 instance and let's see exactly who I am when logged into those instance types. Okay, so I've logged into my instance and I'm going to run the AWS STS. Oh, I always get that wrong in dot SYSS. TS get caller identity. And you can see I'm logged into the console as myself. Hit enter and we should exactly get back the local credentials. When you're running on an EC2, it's pretty much like if you're running on a local computer. It's looking for either command line options, environmental, or an .aws directory where it can find the credentials and the configuration there. So on an EC2 running an AWS, you don't pick up like the permissions of who you're logged into the console. It's just like if you were on a local computer. So you'll need to run configure or set up those environmental variables or use the command line options. Now, let's take a look at Cloud Shell and see what we have there. Here, when we run the AWS STS get caller identity, you'll find out, in fact, you are exactly who you're logged into the console ad as here. You'll see I come in as, yep, users, instructors, BC Horn, which is my IAM user account. So when you're in Cloud Shell, it's whoever you're logged to as, uh, whoever you're logged in to the console as. That's a lot of word salad. But remember, on an EC2, it's just like if you're on a local computer and you'll need to run something like AWS Configure to actually set up your authentication. Now, last subject, doing custom authentication with an AWS CLI. I would have to say about three or four times when I was out in the field working with customers, I would run into this situation. They needed a custom authentication method for the AWS CLI command. It's very easy to do, in fact, it's not that complex. All you have to do in the configuration is set up a custom profile, and then in that custom profile, whatever you name it, like in this case, I've called it custom auth profile, simply set a variable equal to either the script or the application that will do the custom authentication. In this case, I have a script called user local cust creds. I'm gonna set that, I'm gonna set credential uh, credential process equal to that, and then I'm gonna pass in the username Bob. Now, obviously, passing in that username is a bit problematic in this situation since we're using something hard-coded in a file. This is just an example of what you could do. You could actually pick it up from the environment, like what is the logged in user's name, whatever the case may be. Here's the most important part though, whether it's a script or it's an application, you need to return a blob that looks like what you see on the screen right now. Version one, the access key, secret access key, just like what you generated from inside the AWS console, use something you're gonna be doing programmatically and putting in there, along with a session token and an expiration date. You pack that in there, you set that credential equal to that back in the config file, and you get the custom authentication. So whatever the process may be, where you're running out to Active Directory, maybe you're checking some other directory source that AWS doesn't give you an easy way to use as like in an SSO type format, you can use this particular approach to create a custom authentication method to the AWS CLI. So in conclusion, first, force most precedence. Please remember that precedence. It's the sort of thing that comes up on the exam. It's the command line options, highest precedence. Second highest is environmental variables. Third is going to be the AWS CL, uh, configure command or AWS quick config. And then finally, if you're running a container in AWS, whatever your credentials are for the ECS environment, and that's gonna be your general process that you're gonna go through when you're thinking about, okay, what is my precedence level? And then finally, the very last one, who are you logged into an instance as? But remember with that one, AWS configure also comes in. Command line options, you can do things like overrides for regions, profiles, whatever the case may be. Quick config, that's the one we did together. It's the most popular way of, of setting up a local environment, lets you set your credentials, lets you also set your um, configuration. Don't forget about Git set and import. It's great ways of bringing in quickly your credentials into the environment and get that set up for you. 
EC2 instance, Cloud Shell with the instance, you're gonna be running AWS config as the most popular way to do it. In Cloud Shell, it's whomever you are logged into the console as, you pick up that permission. Finally, Docker, you can mount the local.aws directory. And as always, with, with the AWS CLI, over the past couple of years, they've given us the ability to do custom authentication. And that was the last thing we looked at. Again, the most important thing being there, you return that blob correctly so that you get the custom authentication within the AWS CLI. Hey builders, let's now talk about the command basics, or really just how, what's the very basics of working with the AWS CLI. So we're gonna look at structure, how we can use help, that gets a lot of people confused. It's easy to use with just a little bit of guidance and I'll show that to you. Parameter types, filtering output options, and then finally a brief touch on auto prompt and a few supported services via the wizard. So here's the basic idea, here's the basic structure of one of these commands. It's AWS, command, and the command is usually the service like EC2 or S3. Then subcommand like list or uh, describe a spot instance history, which we'll actually be doing in this video. So for example, AWS S3 list, or things like AWS EC2 describe spot price history. Now, the thing about it is, is there's a lot of options that are available with any of these commands, and knowing how to use help is gonna change how you fundamentally approach using the AWS CLI, whether you love it or you hate it. So here's the basics of using the help. The first thing to do is to remember it's contextual. If you do AWS help, it's gonna give you a ton of help about just the AWS command. Not very useful. But if you go AWS S3 help, it's gonna sort of start narrowing down all that material to just S3. Even to the point if you wanna do AWS S3 LS or list, it would narrow it down even further. Now, when you bring up your help, one of the things you can always take advantage of is the search capability built right into the output by simply using a forward slash. So while you're looking at whatever it is you're trying to find, you get tired of doing the search, forward slash, do a text search, enter, and it'll jump if it finds it right there to that particular part of the manual page. Finally, when you're all done, you hit escape, hit the Q key, and that's how you can finally get out of that thing. You don't have to do a control X or a control Z to shut the thing down. Just escape Q and it drops you out. Let's take a look at how we can use help by jumping into the console. So just to reiterate, it's always this idea of AWS help, but that's gonna give you help for the entire AWS command line interface tool. It's a bit too much. So you could say AWS S3 help, and it'll narrow it down to help just for using the S3 service with the AWS CLI. Not bad, not bad, but we could be even more precise. We could say something like AWS S3 LS help, in which case, they're using this to list items or buckets. It gets a lot more descriptive of exactly what we may be looking for. Now, how do you search for things? Again, it's the forward slash. If you'll notice in the bottom left, we simply have the colon and the cursor. If I do forward slash, I can now do things like recursive. And it'll find any instance that appears of recursive. Now, to find the next instance of recursive, don't do forward slash recursive. It always remembers the last thing you search for. So simply do forward slash again, hit enter, and it'll jump to right exactly that next entry. In this case, we get to find out exactly what recursive is. As you can see, it's actually pretty useful in terms of figuring out what exactly recursion, recursion would do with AWS S3 LS. Let's take a look at how we would use this for that spot history command though. AWS EC2, describe spot history, and then we'll do help. Again, it's contextual. It takes us right into describe spot price history, and I'm interested in sort of narrowing this thing down. That is, I want to find a way, if it's possible, to look for just a particular instance type in the spot price history information. So let's look for instance. Instance types, there it is. So we do have an option where I can do dash dash instance types to narrow down the, all the instances that would come back for a particular spot history. But I want you to notice something there. Notice that it's plural. It doesn't say instance type. It says instance types. That is a parameter type known as a list. 
With the list, it typically gives you that sort of that plural indicator, in this case, instance types, and you can supply more than one particular value for that particular thing you're looking for, in this case, instance types. So if we run our command AWS EC2 describe spot price history, I can now do instance types M5 large, M5 extra large. Let's go run the command and see what we get. So I've got our command in AWS EC2 describe spot price history, instance types, M5 large, M5 extra large. Give it just a moment to run. It's a pretty big list that it needs to come back with. And there we go. And you can see we've actually got some pretty cool information here. Availability zone, instance type, in which case we've narrowed it down. Instead of it giving us like every different instance type that's available, we've really brought it down to just the M5 large and extra large. Production, uh, product description, spot price, and then a timestamp. Now, let's talk about that timestamp next. How can we work with that? Well, that's using what's called the ISO 8601 format. Timestamps give us that ability to narrow things down quite a bit. In this case, it's really important. When we're talking about spot price history, we don't want to just open it up to every bit of data that's out there. We typically want to focus on just one particular time frame. In this case, we can put in the ISO 8601 format. Now, notice what it is there. We have year, 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 month, month, day, day. If you were to be more specific with the time, you put the letter T in, as you see there on the screen, and then the hour, minute, and seconds. You don't have to do the time. You can do just year, 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 month, month, day, day. That's fine. In this case, adding to what we've already done with our command, we have something that's going to look like this and sort of bring in that time frame. Now let's go run this command and see if it actually works. So now what I've got here is the same command, M5 large, M5 extra large, but starting on March 6th of 2023 at 7.08 Zulu, and going to 809 Zulu of the same day. Run that command and you can see we now, yes, it is, it is brought into like 739, 739, keeping us right in that time frame. Fantastic. Now, the next thing is this, and this is sort of a, a side subject. It doesn't fit smoothly in here and I don't know any place else to do it. It has to do with the Boolean type. With this output like this, sometimes we end up with a lot of data. And we're not even sure if we have the right security context, that is our, whatever we've configured with the AWS CLI, whether it's from the profile, you're running AWS configure, to find out if we can actually run it. Well, that's where some Boolean, Boolean options, things like human readable and dry run come in. Let's take a look at those briefly. With a human readable option, the idea is this, when the command shows up or that option shows up in your command, it means make this happen. It doesn't have to be set to true or false, yes or no. It just simply, you turn it on by actually putting in human readable. In this case, if you were looking at something in the CLI and it was talking about sizes, instead of getting bytes, you would more than likely get Gibby bits back. Much easier to figure out what that means. Now notice the next one there, the dry run. What dry run attempts to do is run your command without actually executing it. It actually throws back an error. The thing to check though is the output to see it would have worked, but you selected dry run. What it's checking for is security. Do you have permissions to run the command? So you simply add this dry run at the end of the command, whatever it is, it'll try to run the command. It won't run it though. It'll just check to see if you could have run it. Let me show you what that looks like in the console. So we've got the command ready to go and I will simply add the dry run. And again, I don't have to set it equal to true or anything like that. That alone is up because it is, again, a Boolean value. Its presence indicates true. Hit enter. And we're gonna get back our error saying that it was a dry run operation. And this is the thing you're looking for. Request would have succeeded, but dry run flag is set. And that's your indicator. From a security point of view, this command would have run just fine. And in cases where it's going to be a really raw, long running command and you're not sure if you've got the syntax right, try the dry run first. It'll make sure, for, at least from a security point of view, hey, this thing's going to work versus trying to figure out security and then the syntax afterwards. Now, the next thing is this. We've got a lot of data coming back, a lot of different values. Let's start trying to narrow it down. And we're going to use both filter and query to make that happen. What is important to remember about this, and I cannot stress it enough, is where the filtering, the querying, whatever you want to call it, is actually happening. When you say filter, that's going to happen on what I say, this, what I would call server side, or in this case is the AWS side. That is, AWS is only going to return data to your command 
that fits that particular filter. Querying happens on the client. If you want to kind of keep something in, in your mind, remember querying on the client, querying on the client when it comes to the AWS CLI. That lets you narrow down what's actually output to the screen. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the filter to set the product description to Windows. That is, instead of looking at Red Hat, Ubuntu, whatever might be available in the spot price history, we're only going to look at systems that are running Windows. And then we're going to do a spot price history spot price. What that'll do is instead of seeing like the availability zone, the product description, it'll just give us the spot price. Let's jump back over to the console, run these two and see what we get. Okay, first we'll do the filter and we'll bring it down to just Windows. Now, again, you can see up here in my console right here, we do have a Linux Unix system that showed up. Scroll just a bit. You can see there's a red hat. Now, when we run this command, you'll see those are actually omitted from the return. There you go. Windows, Windows, Windows. Just the Windows type came back. Clear that out. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Actually, let me run it again. And now what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to filter it so I just get spot prices. That's where querying comes in. So remember, that's the idea. Filtering, we filtered what we got back. We only got the Windows systems back in our spot price description history. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take out availability zone instance type because we know that stuff. Well, in the case of AZs, we don't care. We know the instance type. It was only two. Production type, we know it's Windows. We just want to know what the spot price was. That's where the query part comes in. We hit bring our query back. And now I'm going to add in the dash dash query and say spot price history star spot price. Now, how did I know to do that? How could I figure that out? How can you figure that out? Look at the output from the last command. Let's scroll up to the top. Spot price history. That's where this piece right here comes from. I look at the structure of the JSON. And I use that to find my way through that JSON path to the value I want. In this case, it starts out here, the very first thing, spot price history. So that's what I start my query with, spot price history. Then I do a star inside that bracket. That way I include everything that came back in the spot price history array. Then I simply say dot spot price, which you see right here. Now, if there was something up under that, let's say there was price and then spot price, current price, some jibber jabber. What you would do is you'd say spot price history, price, spot price. You just see how you just work your way through the navigation, down through the JSON object model. In this case, spot price is immediately under spot price history. So I'm going to leave it like that, hit enter, and we should get back just the spot prices. Think about that for a second. You've been asked for March 6th at a particular time frame, about an hour, what was the spot prices for Windows-based systems running on M5 large and M5 extra large? If you think about that, that's a pretty tricky thing to do. In fact, trying to figure out in the console might be a little bit heavy handed, but you can see there with that one command, we were able to really nail down exactly what those prices were on that day. And that's the power of the AWS CLI using those queries. And I'm going to say probably the biggest part of this is not only figuring out the query, but then save these things off. Save them off into your you know, text file of awesome queries with the AWS CLI, whatever you want to call it. But these will allow you to quickly bring back those values, rerun these histories, whatever it is you need to do with the AWS CLI. Now, one of the last things we're going to do as far as actually outputting anything is going to be looking at the output options. And I really, this is something I really, really like to talk about. Here's why. The output that you do, and it's simply doing the dash dash output to override any environmental variables. We'll talk about implementation in just a moment. You can choose JSON, YAML, YAML, uh, streams, text, table, whatever the case may be. Now, the reason it's very powerful in this particular case is think of a situation where you have developers working in Python to create an application that your financial operations team can use to sort of dig into the cloud data when it comes to prices and how much you're spending. Running a command like we just saw would output that to JSON by default, or you could say dash dash output JSON, then give that to them and they could consume it into the application better using Boto3, Python itself could actually run that, create the JSON object, consume it, and then put it out to a user interface. So think about those sorts of things when you're actually creating these commands. Where is it actually going? What we're going to do in this one is actually use the table output. So there's the format types. And then to implement it, we can either say output, which is what we're going to do. 
You could use the AWS default output environmental variable, or when you do your AWS configure, the last option is output. You can simply type table, JSON, YAML, whatever the case may be. What we're going to do with all the querying we've done, we're actually, we're going to take out the query for just spot price. We're going to remove that so we get just our time frame, our instance types, just for Windows, and we're going to put it and have it formatted as a table, something we could copy and paste into a report. Check this out. So here's the command we just ran. Let's just get rid of this query right here. Don't need to query down. We want to get all that data. And I'm going to change this to dash dash output table. Enter. Hey, that's a good looking table right there. Now, depending on how big your font is and how wide your window is, you're either going to get a nice table like this or it's going to look really, really ugly. Mess around with your font sizing. Mess around with the size of your window and you can usually get a pretty nice table output. The cool thing about this is screenshot, copy and paste. This is a great thing to put into a report to show, hey, this is what our pricing was for the particular availability zones on this day. It's just fantastic. Now, last two things I want to show you is a little bit of additional help that you can use. The first one being CLI output. CLI output actually goes by the more formal name of the auto prompt. Here's the idea. So you've got AWS S3. You don't know what you want to do with the S3. You need a little bit of help figuring it out. You don't want to go run help. You run the command CLI auto prompt, and it'll actually give you sort of a guided sort of way of putting together a command. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you I'm going to about to make a mistake, and I'm trying to do this mistake. Well, I'm not going to try to. I am going to make this mistake on purpose because I'm going to show you that what the CLI auto prompt is really all about is helping you construct the query. If you've got bad data, it's going to let you run that bad data. It's about constructing sort of a sensible type query. Let's jump over and see what we can do with the CLI auto prompt. So I'm back in my terminal window and I'll do AWS S3. And again, not sure what I need to do here. So I'll do CLI auto prompt. It'll give us a nice little drop down so we can choose S3. Then what command I want to do, ls. And then this is really, to me, where auto prompt shines. The fact that I can do dash dash, and it shows me all the options I've got available with a little bit of text to help me figure out which each one does. For example, if I want to do a recursion in my search, that, oh, I do have an option. If I want to make it human readable. Now notice also, it's also in that first bracket right there telling you what type of parameter it is. In this case, remember human readable was a Boolean. Is it on? Is it off? Summarize, on, off. Request payer, string, confirms, you know, are you going to be running an request, a request payer type uh, format? Whatever the case is. This is a really cool way of helping you a little more quickly figure that out. Now I do want to show you this though. Again, it helps with you sort of create the command. It's not going to stop you from doing something like US East 12. It's actually going to try to run that. And the way it does it is, is once you've constructed your command, you hit enter, be patient, and it actually runs that command. In this case, it ran AWS S3 with a region of US 12, which obviously that does not exist. Had I used the proper command S3, ls region us east one it would have run exactly as you would have expected and simply output the data so keep that in mind as far as you know sort of that creation of the command the aws cli auto prompt is pretty handy but if you put in bad data it's still not going to execute as you would expect Last thing before we leave the uh, subject of AWS CLI is the CLI wizard. And I'm putting this in here because if it shows up on an exam, I know a lot of people would think CLI wizard. I've never heard of that. That sounds like some made up jibber jabber. That can't be right. No, it's a real thing. But it only works for certain services and only certain features of those services. So you can use it with configure, DynamoDB, events, IAM, and Lambda. In fact, I'll, I'll do a, a brief demo with Lambda, not even going into it, just showing you how it starts off. The thing I want you to notice is this, they do have a GitHub page. The AWS CLI has a really good GitHub page where you can really look in. And if you go to customizations, wizard, wizards, you can see that. Let's jump over and take a look at that. Here you can see the page and you can see just the few services that are actually being supported. I would suspect that at some point in the future, if they did, you can see it's it's been a while since, let me move so you can see those years there. 
five, three, two, four months, three years. It's been a while since anybody's really been working on this too much. I think there was an update just a couple of days ago to something. But if they ever did add any more services, this is where you'd be able to find information about it. Let's try out Lambda, just so you'll be familiar with what it looks like when you run the wizard. So the way it works is you do AWS, the service that you want to work with, and then type wizard. Now at this point, if you've got to typically point out or put in a function type. Um, I don't know what it's going to be for any particular service. Since we don't know what it is, what should we do? Use help. So within the context of running AWS Lambda, Lambda Wizard, let's get some help. Not the best help I've ever seen, but it does give us one thing really important. Available commands, in this case, new function. So let's try that new dash function and then we can see what wizard actually does it gives us sort of a guided tour through creating a thing in the cli actually this is almost like an auto prompt so um my lambda function then you can come down here and select your runtime mm, that's pretty handy and then go through doing things like setting permissions setting the handlers previewing and then done and this would actually create the command that would be used programmatically to create your Lambda in AWS via the CLI. Pretty handy. Uh, it's got a few edge cases where it's actually useful, but in most cases, for most services, there won't be a supporting service inside the AWS CLI wizard. So that's our basics right there. It's quite a bit. Here's the things I want you to remember. Remember the basic structure. It's AWS, then typically the service, the command you want to run on the service, and then parameters and options. How do you figure out how to use it? Use the contextual help command. So AWS S3 help will give you all the help that you'll need for using the S3 command in the AWS CLI. Parameter types, we just touched on three in this particular video. I hope it helps you understand how to use them properly and also understand how you can take a massive amount of output, particularly some things like describe spot history and start bringing it down. Filtering, remember, querying is on the client. Querying is on the client. That's how you could bring down all those fields, in our case, to just the spot price. Filter happens on the AWS side, where you can say, just return Windows instances to me. Output options, JSON, YAML, YAML streams, tables, all that are there. And also, remember tables. It can be a great way to get data if you're being asked for it into a really nice format and give it to others. There's the CLI auto prompt that can help you actually construct a particular command. But remember, if you pass in something that doesn't make sense, like US East 12, it's not going to work. And then finally, limited help. There's a such thing as wizard. So if it shows up in the AWS exams somewhere, yes, it's a real thing. But remember, it's limited with the services and it's limited with the functionality of the services that you'll find inside the AWS CLI. Okay, builders, in this brief video, I wanted to continue our look into how to use the AWS CLI and focus on Amazon S3. In this particular case, I want to show that, in fact, first of all, there's more than one way of calling S3. Then we'll look at a couple of pretty handy tools, sync and pre-sign. And then finally, some of the commands you can use with Glacier to work with that particular service. But first of all, I want to start with just this idea of S3, because in fact, there's more than one way to call the S3 service. There's the way you're probably used to, where you just simply say, hey, AWS S3, make a bucket. But there's also the control plane call, which is S3 control, create bucket. And I'm just simply using this as an example with creating the bucket or, or things like that. There's actually many, many, many commands. And in fact, on the third one, S3 API create bucket, there's a great many commands available to us. In fact, this is one of the big differentiators that makes this such a useful tool for systems operations. For example, with the S3 make bucket, yes, you can create a bucket and it's sitting out there and it's good to go. However, with the S3 API call, what you can do is not only make the bucket, but then you can actually assign it to someone else via the grant permission. It's a very handy tool at the highest level to not only just create a bucket, but then do some of the more advanced operations that may be available for a particular bucket. Also with the uh, 
S3 API, we can do some pretty fancy querying. For example, finding all the buckets that begin with INE. In this case, query, buckets, and now we're going to use this query command here. We're going to say it starts with name INE equals true. Basically, what that is letting you know is that this is a Boolean operation. Does it start with the name INE? If it's true, we need to see that name. It's a fairly easy command to understand and is available when we're doing things like S3 API, if needed. It is available in other areas, but this is one where it really shows up and really shines. Let's take a look at how this command would look if we actually ran it from the CLI. You can see here I've got it typed into my window here. So I'm going to list queries bucket, a query. Buckets starts with INE true. We can run that out. And we get a sort of standard query output. And of course, with something like this, you could always do an output, move it into a table format, and get a really nice output as well. Makes no difference. But the basic idea here is that when we start using these little more sophisticated commands, we can really, really nail down what we may be looking for inside AWS, particularly in cases where you're being to ask things like, find all the buckets that begin with I and E. It's a great way to accomplish a task like that. Staying with the simpler commands of S3, though, I wanted to show you Sync. Sync is a great utility for synchronizing S3 buckets to local folders. Useful for on-demand backups. For example, you're working on a project on your local computer. You don't have a way to back it up that's easy. Sync would be a great way to, first of all, obviously push a copy of those materials up to S3, but then by simply rerunning Sync, synchronize that local folder to the bucket. One scenario where I've seen it done quite a bit is where there's a compression that's needed. Basically, you have an S3 bucket sitting out in AWS with some objects in it that are very large in size. So what do you do? You run sync to bring them down to your local computer, compress them down to the smaller size, and then sync back to the bucket to complete the operation. One caveat to this is going to be money. Specifically, this cost right here of removing that material. Now, in this particular case, one thing you could do is, is you could actually make this a local EC2 instance and then use an access point to stop this cost from happening. Either way, S3 Sync would allow you to do that. Let's take a look at this command in action. So I have a bucket that I've already created, and it's called the S3, I'm sorry, pardon me, I and E, sync bucket. It has one file in it, a little JSON file, user.json. I want to compress that. Here's what I can do. I can say AWS S3 sync, and then I give it the name of the bucket first, that is where are you coming from. If you're doing it local to the bucket, we'd say dot here, but we're going to start with the bucket name first. Then we say dot to indicate the local directory. Hit enter. And after a moment, if we do a list, you'll see we actually have user.json local on the computer. At this point, it'd simply be a matter of saying, zip up that local file, and then reverse your sync by saying dot here and sending it up to the bucket. Now, if we take a look at the contents of that bucket again, you'll see we have both the user.json and the archived zip, which <laughs> is a little bit larger. Hey. Things happen, but you get the gist of it. You can see how you could quickly make this a script where you could iterate over the files, compressing them. And keep in mind when you do things like this, make sure you're actually getting some compression here. The next handy utility is the S3 pre-sign. With the S3 pre-sign, what you have the ability to do is, regardless of the configuration of a bucket, doesn't matter what the security is, you can share files. You can also set timeouts so the URL doesn't last for very long, and it allows access to that file. Now, the thing to remember is access to the URL allows access to the file. That is to say, there's no passwords or anything like that. If someone gets the URL, they can get to that file. Let me show you what I mean. We we'll actually will create a pre-signed URL for our user.json object here. So we simply say AWS S3 pre-sign, 
and then simply put in the S3 path to our object that is there. Hit enter. And now we have a URL that we can share. Any user can click on this, and when they do, they'll download this file. Now, do, one thing I do want to show you, and that is this. Notice the contents of our bucket is simply the archive.zip and the user.json. I can do the following, and it will work. And you see, I get a URL. Now, the thing is that we know this URL is not going to work because there's not a file called another user.json. So be aware that when you're creating a URL using the pre AWS S3 pre-sign, that the URL you create is going to be emitted. You need to ensure that the file actually exists in your target bucket. Lastly, let's talk about Glacier. This is where AWS, S, AWS CLI is absolutely needed because otherwise pushing vault, uh, archives up to vaults becomes just too tedious. In this case, the actual commands are very simple. It's simply Glacier create vault, upload your archive, and then monitor that archive via initiation of the job, describe the job, and list the jobs. And you can watch them actually run through and then finally complete. If need be, you can then delete the archive and delete the vault if necessary. This is an outstanding candidate for a scripting situation where after you've created the vault, so this part is kind of out of it, but this part here could be on a loop. Right here. Just loop this over and over until all the, ar all the archives are up to Glacier. Then, of course, necess if necessary, you can always delete things. But this part right here, Excellent candidate for a loop where you're going to be uploading, uploading, uploading files to Glacier using the AWS CLI. Okay, builders, I'm going to take you through a demo of using the AWS CLI to work with an Amazon EC2 instance. And then we're gonna kind of use a scenario here. It's the idea of a rolling update. And if you're not familiar with that, I'll show it to you in just a moment. More than that though, it's really gonna be the methodology, the way I use help to figure out the things that I need for my filter, how I can use describe instances to actually look at those systems. And then a little bit at the end, not really part of anything AWS would expect you to use, but something a lot of people would expect you to be able to do on the job, how to set up continuous monitoring by setting up a do loop using the command. So here's the idea of a continuous update. You can have an infrastructure where you have multiple load balancers all sitting behind a Route 53. The Route 53 itself is sending out equal amounts of redirects to each of the IP addresses on those load balancers. And of course, the load balancers talk to the systems that are on the backside. It's these systems on the backside that we're interested in. It, specifically, when we want to update the AMIs, that for every system that we have out there, something has happened security-wise, a feature, whatever, we need to change out the AMIs. So they start changing out one by one by one until one breaks. So how do we monitor for something like that? Or how do we check to see, are there any instances out there still running the old AMI? All the rest are running just fine. But that one right there, for some reason, just didn't make it. Now, in this particular case, what we want to be able to do is identify an instance by the AMI, filter it by the state. Is it running? Is it pending? Is it shutting down? Whatever the case may be. And then can we monitor continuously for the update, that last little part that we spoke about? So let's jump into the CLI and see if we can figure that out together. And by the way, as I go into this, if you want to, if you have your own AWS account, spin up an EC2 and you can kind of play along with me when I go through these particular steps. It'll work exactly the same. Better if you have an INE account, go into our sandbox, spin up an EC2 and do this exact same thing. This will work just fine in Cloud Shell. So you don't have to spin up an EC2 just to go into like as a Bastion host or anything like that. Don't do that. Just jump in, start an EC2, go into the Cloud Shell service and follow along. Okay, so the first thing is, remember, help is contextual. I know I'm gonna be using the EC2 service, so I can at least know this much of the command, but from here, I'm gonna need some help. 
Now from here, this is just a little bit of mm, getting used to AWS and some of the terminology it uses. In this particular case, what I'm probably gonna be doing is looking for something to do with instance or instances, plural. What we'll do is we'll start by looking for instance. Now, in your help, as you scroll down, there's the available commands in that list. You can always step through one by one by one. Eh, it's kind of a long ways to do it. Instead, we're going to search because we're smart about this. How do we search? We use the forward slash as you see there on the screen in the bottom left hand corner. Right over there. And then we're going to look up instance. Now, remember, after you hit enter, all you have to do is hit forward slash enter again to continue looking for instance. So we're going to hit enter there. Accept reserve instances exchange quota. Probably not what we're looking for, but do notice that on the screen right there. Do you see the stuff about VPCs? That's right. When you want to work with VPCs, any VPC related type stuff, for example, as you can see there, advertise, uh, bring your own IP CIDR, allocate hosts, gateway VPC attachment, whatever the case is, that lives inside the EC2 bucket of commands. Well, that's not what we're looking for, so we're going to forward slash hit enter again. Associate IAM, hey, that's a pretty cool command just to kind of stick in your memory remember from the command line, you can associate an IAM instance. Still not what we're looking for or associate instance, we'll keep looking. Bundle, not quite what we're doing. Create, probably not. What we're probably more than likely looking for is something with describe. That tends to be the way AWS sets us up when we want to find things. So if we keep going eventually, we should get to something that describes. And it looks like we're there. Let's keep looking. And there it is right there. Describe instances is the one that we want. So, okay, so there we go. So describe instances. And also notice you can do status, type offerings, credit specifications, attributes. A lot of things are available as sort of a sub command to describe instances. So let's use that. But now here's the thing. We don't know anything about describe instances. It just sounds like the right thing. Contextual help. We'll take out the help, we'll do describe instances. Then we'll do help again to see exactly what this thing can do for us. Specify instance IDs, output include information for only specify. Okay, so it looks like this could be it. It's gonna output information. Let's go down into filters. There is a filters section. Now, notice that, wait, let me, let me do this for you. Notice over there, it says, filters, it's plural. This is important when we actually do a filter here in a moment, because remember, we want to look at the status and the AMI. So you don't do like filter status, then filter AMI. You do filters and do them both together. So this looks like this might be the way to go. Let's see if we can find anything in the help about image, because that's what the AMI is, an Amazon machine image. So again, we're going to do a search, forward slash image, enter, Boom, this time we found it immediately. You see it right there at the top of the screen, image ID. Now, just in case you've forgotten, this is a filter, okay? So let's scroll up again. Actually, let's scroll down past all the filters and you can see it gives us the structure. So if you ever get confused about how to do this, scroll on down to the bottom of the list of the filters for whatever it is you are looking for and it'll give you the syntax for doing this. So let's just, let's just give that a shot. So. AWS, EC2, describe instances, and let's just hit um, and bring in filter, I uh, actually dash dash filter, and then we're gonna do double quote name equals, pardon me, image ID, and that's fairly typical right there. In a lot of cases when you're working with filters in the AWS CLI, the individual elements like image ID, there's going to be a dash in the middle. So just kind of keep that in mind. If you start to put the other filter, it starts saying, I can't find that filter. Look at the actual string itself. In this case, we have image ID. It kind of makes sense for that dash to be there. Then we'll do values, which is plural. And what we'll do is, is I'm going to kind of, I hate to say this, jump over to the console and I'm going to grab that image ID and paste it right in here for us. Okay, and there it is posted in. By the way, we didn't have to necessarily do it that way. What we could have done was actually run a describe instances. Uh, yeah, I'm not in the way. Describe instances and just list every instance out there and try to find the right AMI. Sometimes just having this in the console, going ahead and just post, pasting it in there is the best way to go. By the way, this is a true string search. So for example, if you knew it was 277AF at the very end there, 
but you didn't remember the rest of it, you could always do AMI dash star and then end it with the 277 AF and it'll find all the instances that are running with that particular image ID. Let's go ahead and run this and see if we get a result. Ah, we're in good shape. We're in very good shape. Okay, so that works. So here's the other part now. This is going to be all the instances. Let's actually, let me quit out of this and bring that command back. That's all the instances with this AMI, not all the running instances with this AMI. That's our next step. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a space. Now remember, this is filter. So let's bring it back to the beginning here. Change it from filter to filters, make it plural. And now let's add in the next part of our filter, which is going to be name equals. And oops, I don't remember what this is. So how do we figure out what we need to look for when we don't know? That's right. We're going to go right back into help. So let's go down to this part right here and let's do help. I'm looking for status, like running statuses in this particular case. So I'm going to make a bet that we could just do a quick look for status and find what we're looking for. There's block device, not what we want. Metadata, not what we want, not what we want. Network, network interface, status. Not exactly what we were looking for there. Let's try that again. Yep, we were in filters. Again, we're going to look for status. That didn't seem to be the right way. So let's try something else. Let's try, well, it should be running. That's another neat way of doing this. When you can't think of the filter that it could be, think of how you would describe that filter and do a search for that. I know running is one of the states. Nope. Wait, nope, host ID, that's not it. But my eyes already caught where I'm going, so I'm gonna do a forward slash again. And there we go, instant state code and instant state name. Let's stop here for a second. Notice what we've got there. We've got a code and we've got a name. Be careful about this. With the code, we will be looking for what? 16. Is that a good query to do? Well, yeah, it's, it's perfectly fine. It'll work. But if you were to give this piece of code to somebody else and say, hey, run this command, would they know 16 is running? Maybe, maybe not. That's why typically if there's a code, there's also an instance state name, or in this case, just name or name, it's instant state name, said that backwards, where we can actually say running. So what we want to do is take our command that we just ran, add the new filter instance state name, and there's that syntax again, separating with a dash, and set that equal to running. So there we go. And again, go back and set this to filters. There we go. And we're going to add in the new filter. So name equals instance state name and then comma values. And you can see my terminal here is trying to help me out by giving me what I need already. Running double quote and we'll end it right there. Let's see how it does. Ah, good. We got back results. And of course, we could always step through and make sure this looks the way we expect. Very, very good. Now, here's the last bit. What I want to do is, is I don't want to see this sort of output. I just want to see a listing of the AMIs or maybe the instance IDs. Let's do that. Let's do instance IDs. I know the AMI. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to have sort of a rolling, or at least I could return the command again and go, how many instances are currently running with that AMI? With a rolling update like we spoke about, as the load balancers are given the new AMI for the launch package, it's going to start rolling the old ones out and bringing the new AMIs in, new instances with the new AMI. So you can quite literally watch as the old AMIs are stacked up here, the new AMIs are at zero. It's sort of do like that. In this case, we're just going to be looking at old instances going away over time. So in order to get the query right, now remember the query, the query happens where? On the client. So we've pulled down all the running systems with the particular AMI, and I want to get their instance ID. We can see that value right here. So it's reservations, instances, instance ID. That's what we'll use for our query. 
And this is one of the things I love about this particular terminal. If you're wondering what I'm using, this is a terminal application called Warp. Um, I can easily scroll through the results of what I just ran and I keep my cursor right there. So no matter how I scroll here, that stays right there. Pretty handy. Dash dash query. And now I'm going to put in my query search. In this case, reservations, instances, instance ID. Let's run that and see what we get. There we go. And this, that's actually correct. We have three instances in the INE demo environment right now running this particular AMI. So fantastic. It looks great. Now, remember the output. This is kind of ugly. I don't like that. Let's see, maybe it would look better with a table output. And you know it is. I wouldn't be doing this. Ah, that looks good. Now, here's the idea. You can sit there as an operator, as somebody just watching your systems, whatever the case is, and just sort of up arrow, hit the return key, and check as often as you want to. And what you'll see happen, uh, eventually, as you start cycling, you'll start seeing systems sort of come offline. That is, I'm going to change one of these to a stop state. Confirm my stop. Rerun my query. And there we go. Now we're down to two. And notice that's really quick. That's very quick. One thing I will warn you about, though, when you are running any sort of query like this and it comes back like, wait a minute, those instances shouldn't be there. And this is something I've seen quite a bit at customers when I was out in the field. They would query four and they would expect it to go from five to four to three to two. Instead, it just stayed at five, five, five. That's probably going to be a problem with your filter more than likely, or filters, I should say, in this particular case. So if you start getting strange output that doesn't make any sense to you, it's not an AWS thing or anything like that. It's probably your filter has got something wrong with it. Now, how could we turn this into a continuous update? Well, this is the part where we get outside AWS. And what we're going to do is we're going to use basically the power of the command line to do a loop. So what I'll do is this, I will say while true, so it loops forever, do, paste in the command we just ran, then I'll do a sleep. Let it sleep for about five seconds, and then finally done. And if I typed everything correctly, there we go. And there's the next instance of it. So it's working just as we expected. In fact, we can continue watching this. And you can say, like, during a rolling update, as things stop disappearing, you'll see them come out of this table list that you're just sort of every five seconds checking. The idea being this, if you're running some sort of migration and you're needing to keep up with, hey, how many are left? How many are left? How many are left to go? Anything like that. This is what will allow you to do it sort of in a relaxed manner. Just start this up. Get your filter straight first, copy it off to a text file. Up, oh, we just lost the next one. We should be losing the next one here in just a moment. And just let it loop over and over and over until you see that, in fact, all of the machines have been updated. And of course, the other side of this would be probably in another terminal window, have the new AMI checking to see if it's running and watching it sort of change over as well. I'm waiting for this last one to come out along with you. Do you see that? Let's double check. Are all the instants stopped? You can't see it. I can. Yes, they're all stopped. Why do we not see this last one come out? That's because it's now returning nothing. And since nothing's coming out, it's basically stopped. There is a trick question for you right there. In a do loop situation like this, when you use a command line option like this, like we just did, and this is why I did this with you, I wanted you to see that right there. When you get to the end, and nothing else is coming back from the query. You're going to see something like this, and you may be sort of tricked into thinking, oh, it's just returning the same one. That one's stuck. Well, no, look right here. You can see right here, this table is not moving where we had two entries. Normally, these would be moving up. The output has stopped. Everything is done. And what you could always do at this point is just go ahead and do whatever's applicable for your operating system in the query, bring back your initial query, hit Enter on it, and there you go. There's your verification that, in fact, it has ended.
So that's the gist of this particular demo and what I want you to see. First of all, notice we relied on help. We were contextual. We did AWS EC2 help. We found described instances. We did help for the filters, trying to find the right ones. Then in the output, the JSON output, we went through and said, ah, there's instance ID. That'll be really nice for checking. So then we went reservations, instances, image ID, and we output that using our query option. And remember, filters happen on the AWS side, querying happens on the client side. Then obviously we changed our output to table to make it look nice. And then just using a little bit of old hand skill, we went in, created a small little at the command line script to continuously loop. And of course you saw right there that you've gotta be careful with those because it's not going to update when it's no longer getting a result in the AWS CLI. Okay, that concludes our course on the AWS CLI. What are some of the things we covered? Obviously, how do we install it? Keep in mind when, from that, one of the most important things is that precedence order and security. These are the sort of things that can come up in exam situations, and more than that, come up in real world situations while you're trying to figure out why is the AWS CLI acting a particular way. Obviously, how does it behave on an Amazon Linux 2 as well as in Cloud Shell? The help, obviously one of the most important things, understand how it contextually helps you understand the command as you grow it out more and more. Also, don't forget about things like the CLI auto prompt as well as the few wizards that we do have available. How do we use filter and query? And more important with filter and query, understanding where those are actually happening. Filter being on the AWS side, query being local, query being basically a way to reduce down that JSON model that we get back to just the information we need. And obviously in our lab, we saw how we could spin up an EC2, how we could create an EBS volume and add it to that EC2 instance. And then finally, query the EC2 instance to see if it's actually reaching or meeting its reachability requirements. So from here on out, here's my recommendations for you. And this is one of the biggest things, practice, practice, practice with the AWS CLI. Now, when you're using it, when you get in trouble, try to use that help menu. Don't run off to the web page. Give yourself a second, do the AWS service help and try to figure it out. It'll make you much, much more handy and much more productive when using the AWS CLI. Really experiment around with the filter and the query. Remember with the help, you could look through and see those filter commands or rather how they're set up. You remember name dash, name dash, or word dash, word type formats to find the filter that you need. Then apply it along with a query through the JSON model to get just the data you need. And speaking of getting data, once you've got it, being able to output it into a particular format, that is JSON, YAML, being able to put it into a really nice table format for a report so you can show anyone whatsoever in a great, really nice format, here's the current status of our AWS environment. Now, one thing I do wanna ask from you, Leave me a review. I'd love to hear what you think about the course. Maybe something I could add to it. If you really liked it, obviously tell me that. Something you'd like to see added though, I'd love to hear about that too. So I hope you enjoyed the course. I really enjoyed putting it together and I hope, hope, hope it helps you, particularly from a foundation level, to really get the most out of the AWS CLI. <laughs>